Radio. Something's gone wrong. For all our vigilance and battle scars of the Bill of Rights, we let the flame of freedom's torch go cold. Because freedom has only one enemy it cannot defeat. And that is negligence. So your presence here, now, today, of all man's works beneath the heavens, none shines brighter than our Constitution. I think Jefferson and Payne, Mason, Franklin, I think they're looking down right now at us. I think they understand what we're trying to do, what we strive to do. If you didn't have some kind of security on the ground. and liberties away from me in the meantime doing it. I want to be able to enjoy my freedoms and liberties and have that little bit of element of risk. Yeah, it's not a one-sided issue, though, John. It's uh, It's got at least two or more sides to it, and uh, there is no good answer, I don't I don't believe. I think you can compromise somewhere, but it's, it's really no good answer um, to it. It's just a massive problem. I had a friend one time, he was rather... Uh, he was my mentor in government. Uh, he was rather high up with the Department of Energy, and he was um, in charge of uh, a um, location that had atomic waste storage, and the containers were leaking, and it was as far as you could see. And he looked at the problem, and, and he was a, one of the best managers I've ever seen on the earth, and he looked at the problem that he had, and he's put his retirement papers in and got out, and that was his answer. Wow. <laughs> hey, Griff, I'm here, man. Hey, Joe. <laughs> and it's about doggone time. It's Welcome funny. to the show, Joe. Just in time, we have Dr. Wagner and Q, and I'm bringing him on. Hello, Dr. Wagner. Welcome to the show. Uh, hi. Welcome. Thank you. Hey, uh, everybody, just so you know, Dr. Wagner, is uh, he runs the website lhcdefense.org. Uh, he's a physicist and an outspoken critic of CERN and the Large Hadron Collider. And uh, just so you know, Doc, I am one of the uh, biggest laymans when it comes to uh, this topic. However, my co-host John is is more um, versed in the science behind it, so he'll be kind of running the show tonight, <laughs> and I'll be making uh, making comments here and there. But tonight, for me, is a learning experience. As as well as I'm sure a lot of the listeners in our audience, and uh, I'm just glad that the uh, the technical difficulties were uh, were fixed. But um, uh, I guess my first question, uh, Doctor Wagner, is where do you come from? What's your background, and and how did you come to know about CERN and uh, what they're doing there? Okay, I'm gonna go in reverse order. I've known about CERN for you know decades. And I've known what their plans are for probably going on 20 years. Um, and uh, I started uh, vocally opposing them uh, more than 10 years ago, back in 99, uh, when I learned some more theoretical aspects of uh, some of the work that they are, uh, that, that, that time they were planning on doing. Um, I come originally from California. Um, it's where I was born and raised, and I uh, attended uh, UC Berkeley there. Did graduate work in uh, cosmic ray physics there, uh, and then I did uh, got my actually my degree is in law, and uh, thereafter I then did medical physics uh, in San Francisco for another five years, and then worked in education in a number of other fields since then. Uh, so I have a, a diverse background, and I've been well aware of the uh, the efforts to engage in creating new kinds of particles since uh, back in the 70s when I was working at Berkeley. Is it is it um would you say that that creating these particles uh pose a direct threat to our lives and well-being uh, not only for, you know, the human race but uh for the planet? Uh, yes, uh, for the planet, the human race and everything else on the planet. That's correct. Mm -hmm. We we still don't really know uh for certain what can be created at these uh, energies of the collisions that they are uh, intending to do in the future here in a few years when they up the energy as well as we don't currently know what's happening. Uh, they've just started doing uh, collisions of lead uh, atoms or ions uh, here just a few weeks ago and uh, at very low intensity 
uh, they've had to increase the intensity uh, and then stop uh, and go back to doing hydrogen uh, or proton collisions. And uh, I think they're just sort of testing the, little, the water, so to speak, to see, see what happens uh, at very low intensity beams. And uh, we don't have the results yet on that, so we don't know whether they've made anything new or, or not. And uh, we don't know what will happen uh, a few years from now when they are able to double the energy of the beams and try to create something new at that time. So, well, would you? <clears throat> and let me let me say this, folks. Uh, as you guys all know, you know, I'm I'm pretty good when it comes to uh, current events and everything like that. But when it comes to the scientific stuff, I love Star Trek, but um, I don't really know <laughs> much about this. So, John King, take it away. John, are you there? <laughs> John's there somewhere. Yes, I'm here. Uh, okay, good. Go ahead, you, John. Uh, Doctor. Uh, I've heard many rumors about uh, the possibility of uh, black holes and tearing uh, tearing holes in the fabric of space-time. Uh, what's the possibility of uh, CERN creating a black hole in the center of the Earth or very close to the outside of the orbit of the Earth or ripping a hole in space-time? Well, I don't know what you mean by ripping a hole in space-time. Uh, that's what black holes do. Um, generally speaking, so if you're thinking of something else different than that, I don't know what, what that would be. Uh, the prospect of creating an ultra-miniature black hole has been uh, discussed extensively in the literature, and they believe it would be safe to do because they believe that uh, it would uh, either traverse quickly through the Earth or not be able to accrete the Earth and it would instead very rapidly evaporate by a unproven process called Hawking radiation. And uh, we've uh, questioned that extensively because, one, the Hawking radiation is theoretical. It's never been observed. And to, to use that as your safety argument is to us uh, very uh, spacious uh, to do so. And uh, the other argument they've presented is that if these things had been created or could be created, it would have already occurred in nature. Uh, but we've shown that in nature, these things, if they're created, are created at very high speed relative to Earth and traverse the Earth. They raised what's called a neutron star argument, which uh, said if that's the case, and they, then we would see all the neutron stars we see out there, uh, because they, nature would have eliminated those as well. And we've gone in and encountered that as well. And the fact of the matter is we don't really know for certain what would happen. Uh, they are planning on going to a higher energy uh, regime here in a few years after they fix the uh, problem that they, that was created or discovered, I guess, uh, by a major accident here a couple of years ago. Um, they have to go back and re, uh, do some redesign work on the machine before it could uh, uh, handle higher intensity beams that are currently being used. And so we're going to have a whole new regimen of risk at that time uh, if it has not been manifested yet. We don't currently know what's going on with their lead-lead collisions. Uh, they started those just a few weeks ago, and we haven't heard uh, any results, or I haven't heard any results yet. Uh, instead, they've released results of some work uh, that doesn't involve the LHC, uh, but does involve uh, antimatter, and it was a rather interesting work. Uh, it was relatively innocuous. Uh, uh, but uh, sort of a they, they touted it as a breakthrough and I'm just curious as to the, the timing of the release of that information, why they are releasing that data now when instead of releasing information about the lead, lead collisions uh, From what I understand they're able to create antimatter and hold it within a specific field uh, and that they're able to create it and have it be viable for a specific amount of uh, calculable time yeah, I think they uh, they did something like 38 atoms of it and, and left, kept it around for about a third of a second or something like that, uh, which is which is interesting. But um, it was touted as being something uh, novel, never before done. But antimatter has been made for decades. Uh, proton antiprotons, uh, they have been making those at Fermilab, and they've been making them at CERN for for decades too, starting back in the uh, 90s. Uh, they started doing that. Uh, this. Uh, and this does not involve the uh, Large Hadron Collider to do so. It, it involves a, uh, a, a particle accelerator that is a pre-accelerator for the, the collider and uh, a fixed target, and it's a relatively standard technique that's been around for quite some time. Uh, what they did 
differently this time is they uh, had a not only a collection of uh, these uh, anti-protons, but they also had some anti-electrons known as positrons uh, that they also were able to store in a, a magnetic bottle and then bring them uh, together and uh, then form a neutral anti-hydrogen, uh, which was able to last for about a third of a second. And so they have a, a novel type of bottle for maintaining the neutral hydrogen. But keeping antimatter around has been done for decades. Uh, Fermilab keeps it around for hours on end, uh, circulating in, our, in their collider ring. Uh, and so it's not not terribly new, but it is it gives them the ability now, I guess, to to analyze the uh, uh, relatively stationary antimatter uh, in a uh, bottle, see if it uh, ex exhibits the same properties identical to uh, normal hydrogen, which it almost certainly will. But uh, I'm curious that they're releasing that information now when it when it's actually was done quite some time ago and that they aren't releasing information about the lead-lead collisions that are being done in the collider. Now, what does that what does that mean, Doc? As far as that's concerned, uh, when you talk about like the lead lead collision, um, what well, what's what, the what's the danger to that? Well, what what's happening is is they they're accelerating lead ions to uh, relativistic speeds and colliding them head on to, into each other and creating conditions that do not exist anywhere in uh, nature um, and. Uh, in an effort to quote, replicate the Big Bang, unquote, a uh, very miniature version of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is not something that is even occurs in the cosmic rays with these lead-on-lead -lead, uh, collisions at that energy. Um, the, the cosmic rays can have similar energy, but they are going to be proton on nitrogen or something like that. And it's qualitatively different than lead-on-lead. -lead. And so that the reason they're doing it is they're trying to create something new that you can't create in nature. Uh, uh, and they've searched for strangelets in nature and not found them. So they, one of the efforts they're trying to do is create strangelets uh, to the novel type of a particle uh, and so they could analyze those properties. And it would be interesting if we were to know that strangelets are benign, but we don't know that. Um, but some of the theories suggest they could engage in a runaway fusion reaction, and that's the major concern. Uh, not only has CERN uh, on the one side uh, denied the capability of creating strangelets, uh, they have at the same time as they've denied that to the general public, they have uh, created a detector for them called the CASTOR, C-A-S-T-O-R, for mm -hmm. detecting them. And so they're on the one side they're telling the general public that these things can't be created, and that the people such as myself, critics of this, are foolish for suggesting as such. And then at the other time they're, they are creating this uh, particle detector for the purpose of detecting them. <laughs> That's <laughs> <Which> uh, <laughs> be, uh, hypocritical. <laughs> you know? Uh, you think? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. You well, you know, now, there's some historical precedents here, and I'm going to um, I'm going to fall back on my, uh, my uh, let's say, my person with many years of life experience, uh, Griff. Uh, when the atomic bomb was being developed... Right. Uh, I think it was a, a, a possibility at the time they were developing this that they thought, oh, man, this reaction could run away and it could destroy the planet. You know, so. Right. Do you, do, uh, well, Doc, I mean, think about that. I mean, are we facing the same type of thing now, the same type of fear um, where they said, well, you know what? All right. Well, the probability is kind of low, so let's just go with it. Is that the same thing that we're facing now today with this uh, the the strangelets? Pretty much exactly the same thing. Uh, different different kind of a situation, but the exact same type of risk uh, scenario. Uh, back when they were first doing the A bomb, there was two stages of that. First was developing the A bomb, the second was developing the H bomb. Mm -hmm. But uh, they the concern was that they might trigger a, a runaway fusion reaction of the nitrogen in the atmosphere. Ah. Uh, and they and and they did the, the because if you heat it up and you excite the nitrogen enough, nitrogen does fuse spontaneously if you bring them together fast enough, and it will release energy in the process. And and if you have a uh, dense enough medium of nitrogen, you can generate a uh, fusion bomb out of nitrogen. Um, as, as it turns out, though, that the nitrogen in our atmosphere is about the atoms are about 100 times too far apart for that to occur, and so they were running. 
different kinds of calculations and scenarios and think, trying to see if there's some other way in which it could have a, a propagation wave of energy fusion propagating through the atmosphere. And every which way they looked at it, 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 it 